The Hypostasis of the Archons Inspired by the Spirit of the Father of Truth, the Great Apostle reminds us that our true struggle isn't against other people, but against the rulers of darkness, those who have power over this world. They try to keep us from the truth and trap us in ignorance. The head of these rulers is blind, filled with arrogance. He believed he was the only God, declaring, I am God, and there is no one else. But in saying this, he sinned against everything. A voice came down from the realm of incorruptible light, telling him, You are mistaken, Samuel, which means God of the blind. Samuel's thoughts became blinded by his ignorance. He chased after his own twisted power, which led him to chaos, the realm of darkness, where confusion reigns. But this was allowed by a higher plan, for even in darkness, there is a way for light to shine through. Incorruptibility, the eternal realm of light, looked down and saw the waters below. The rulers of darkness became obsessed with the image they saw there, but they couldn't grasp it, for the image was filled with the spirit of light. The rulers, being mere beings of soul without spirit, couldn't capture something from the realm of the divine. So, they plotted to create a human of their own, formed from the earth. They made a body but couldn't give it true life. The human lay on the ground, lifeless, despite all their efforts. Their power was weak compared to the spirit. But then, the spirit from the land of light, full of divine energy, entered the human form. The man became alive and was called Adam, which means human. The spirit gave Adam the power to name all the creatures the rulers had made. The rulers placed Adam in the garden and told him not to eat from the tree of knowledge, for they were afraid he might become aware of their deception. They didn't realize, though, that this was all part of a higher plan, allowing Adam to eventually see through their lies. The rulers decided to make Adam sleep. This sleep wasn't an ordinary one, it was ignorance. While Adam was unaware, they created a woman from him, but it was only her physical form. The spirit-endowed woman, however, appeared to Adam and woke him up, saying, Arise, Adam. When he saw her, he recognized her as the one who gave him life and called her Mother of the Living. She was full of wisdom, healing, and truth. When the rulers saw the woman, they were jealous and tried to take her for themselves. But she transformed into a tree to escape them, leaving only her shadow behind. In their ignorance, they defiled her shadow, not understanding what they were doing. Then, a spiritual being appeared in the form of a snake to guide them. The snake asked, Did the rulers really say you can't eat from any tree? The woman explained that they were forbidden to eat from the tree of knowledge. The snake revealed the truth. They told you this out of jealousy. If you eat, your eyes will open, and you'll be like gods, knowing good and evil. The woman ate and gave some to Adam, and they realized their spiritual nakedness. They tried to cover themselves, but it was clear that they had been deceived by the rulers. The rulers were furious. They banished Adam and the woman from the garden and cursed them with hard lives filled with toil. They wanted to keep them distracted by earthly concerns, so they wouldn't have time to seek the truth. Despite this, the divine plan continued. The woman gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain, filled with jealousy, killed his brother Abel. Humanity's journey into the world of suffering had begun. The woman later gave birth to another child, Seth, who carried a spark of divine light. Another daughter, Noria, was born as a virgin untouched by the rulers. When the rulers tried to seduce her, she rejected them, declaring, I am not your descendant. I come from the world above. The rulers became angry, but Noria cried out to the father of the entirety for help. A great angel, Eleleth, appeared, saving her from the rulers and revealing the truth about their origin and their ultimate downfall. Eleleth explained that the rulers had come into being through a mistake made by Sophia, the divine wisdom. She had tried to create something on her own without the consent of the divine fullness. Her creation was Yaldabaoth, the arrogant ruler who believed he was the only god. However, light had already entered the world, and the rulers would never be able to overcome it. Eleleth assured Noria that humanity's true nature was divine, and one day— the rulers would be overthrown. 
When the true human awakens to their divine spirit, they will rise above death and ascend to the light. In the end, all the children of light will know the truth. They will rejoice and sing, Holy, holy, holy. The father of the entirety is just, and the son reigns forever. On the origin of the world. Long ago, wise people called the soul female, because, in its nature, the soul is like a woman. She even has a kind of womb. When she was with God, her father, she was pure and whole, like a virgin. She had everything she needed, and she was strong. But when she came down to earth and entered a human body, the soul got caught up in the troubles of this world. She was misled by forces that didn't love her, and these false guides treated her badly. Some took advantage of her with lies, and others tricked her with gifts. In the end, she lost her purity. The soul, now confused and hurt, began to give herself away to the wrong things, thinking they would make her happy. She went from one false love to the next, believing each time that she had found something true. But those things only left her feeling empty and ashamed. Still, even when she tried to stop, the world kept pulling her back into the same patterns. The soul felt stuck, and she no longer believed she could escape. She was like a widow alone, sad, and poor. But our loving Father in Heaven never stopped watching over her. He saw her struggle and heard her cry. He knew she wanted to return to him. She remembered the joy she had when she was with him before. So, she called out with all her heart, Father, please save me. I have wandered far from your home. Bring me back to you. And when he saw her in this state, he was filled with compassion. He remembered her beauty, her goodness, and her strength. He knew she had only gone astray for a time and that her heart was still longing for his love. So, he reached out to her, full of mercy and grace, because he knew she was ready to return. The soul story of wandering and return is told throughout the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah, God says, Even though you have been unfaithful, you can come back to me. The soul is like a woman who left her true husband and chased after others, thinking they would give her what she needed. But she was wrong. Nothing the world could offer could fill the emptiness inside her. In the book of Hosea, God says, I will take away everything that you thought made you happy, and when you realize that you are better off with me, you will come back. The soul is like a woman who ran away from home, only to realize that nothing outside could ever match the love and care of her real home. God knows the soul's struggle. He sees how the soul has been deceived, tricked by things that seem good but really lead to emptiness. And yet, he patiently waits for her to realize that only he can satisfy her. The soul finally begins to understand that her true happiness, peace, and purpose come from God, her Father. The journey of the soul is not just about returning to God on the outside, but also a deep inner change. The soul, which had turned away from her true nature, now begins to turn back to her pure and loving self. This is like the process of washing dirty clothes in water, turning them over and over until they are clean again. When the soul turns back to God, she becomes fresh, clean, and new again. This is a kind of baptism, a rebirth of the soul. But this change doesn't happen easily. It's like a woman in labor who struggles and suffers as she brings new life into the world. The soul needs help in this process. She cannot do it alone. So, God sends the soul a partner, a loving guide, Jesus, who is like a husband to her. He is her first love, the one who always knew her best, and he comes to her in her time of need. When the soul cleanses herself from the past and prepares for her true love, she becomes like a bride, waiting for her bridegroom. She no longer runs after things that don't matter. Instead, she prepares her heart for the one true love she has always longed for. She remembers the joy she once had, and she dreams of the day she will be fully reunited with her true husband, Jesus. When the soul turns back to God, it's like a bride waiting in her bridal chamber. She is no longer chasing after false promises or temporary comforts. Instead, she waits with hope, preparing herself for her true love. She no longer needs to fill the emptiness inside her with things that don't last. She trusts that her true love will come to her, someone who is good, 
faithful, and loving. This isn't like an earthly marriage, where people sometimes turn away from each other after a time. In this holy union, the soul and her true love become one. They unite not just for a moment, but forever. The love they share is pure, strong, and eternal. They are brought together by the will of the Father, and their bond can never be broken. This is the love the soul has always been searching for, even when she didn't know it. The Bible tells us that when God created the first man and woman, they were one, Genesis 2 verse 24. But when the woman was misled, the man followed her. Their union was broken. Now, through this divine marriage, the soul is restored to her true love, and they become one again. The soul rejoices, for she has found the one her heart longed for, and she will never be alone again. When the soul finally finds her true love, she feels joy beyond words. She remembers the pain and loneliness she went through when she was lost, but now she is filled with gratitude. She weeps, but this time, it is with tears of joy. She has returned to her rightful place beside her true husband, and she knows she will never have to face the pain of being apart from him again. The Bible speaks of this joy in the Psalms, Psalm 45 verses 10 to 11, Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The soul has turned away from the things of the world that led her astray. She has forgotten the false loves and the painful mistakes of the past. Now, her heart is fully focused on her king, who loves her completely and unconditionally. The soul is no longer wandering or lost. She has found her true home in the love of God. The prophet spoke of this when he said, For the king has desired your beauty, for he is your Lord. Psalm 45 verse 11. This means that the soul has been restored to her original beauty, the beauty she had when she was with God before the world confused her. She is whole again, loved, cherished, and honored by her true Lord. After the soul's long journey, she now stands ready to begin her new life with her true love. She has been washed clean of her past mistakes, and she is filled with new hope and strength. The Bible promises that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength, like an eagle that soars in the sky, Isaiah 40 verse 31. The soul, once weary and burdened, now rises with joy and confidence, ready to live fully in the love and light of her Father. This is the soul's true resurrection, the moment when she is brought back to life, not just physically, but spiritually. She has been set free from the chains that once held her down. She no longer feels the pull of the world's false promises. She knows that real life, real joy, and real love come from being united with God. This new beginning is a gift from God. The soul didn't earn it through knowledge or skill, but through God's grace and mercy. As Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. John 6 verse 44 the soul has been drawn back to her father, and now she is lifted up into the fullness of life. The soul now understands that her return to God wasn't just a matter of words or outward actions. It was a deep, inner change, a change of heart. She turned to God not with her lips, but with her whole spirit, calling out to him in true repentance. She saw how empty her life had been without him and wept over the lost time she had spent chasing after things that couldn't satisfy. But God, who is always good and full of love, heard her cry. He reached out to her with mercy and forgiveness, ready to restore her to her rightful place by his side. The Bible says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Matthew 5 verse 4 The soul's mourning over her past led her to the comfort of God's loving arms. Repentance is the first step toward salvation. When the soul truly turns back to God, he is quick to forgive and welcome her home. The Bible promises, if your sins are as high as the heavens, and if they are as dark as night, return to me, and I will make you clean. Call me your father, and I will call you my child, Isaiah 1 verse 18. God's love for the soul is endless, and his forgiveness is always waiting for those who truly seek it. As the soul turns back to her true love, she undergoes a beautiful transformation. Her old self, filled with regret and shame, begins to fade, and she is made new again. 
The soul becomes like a radiant bride, adorned in love and light, ready to embrace her true identity. Her transformation is not just on the outside, it's a deep renewal from within. She becomes the person she was always meant to be whole, pure, and full of life. This inner change is what the Bible calls being born again. Jesus spoke about this when he said, Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 3 Being born again means that the soul leaves behind the old ways and begins a new life, filled with the love and light of God. It's like being given a fresh start, where the past no longer defines who you are. The soul's transformation is a reflection of God's incredible grace. It's not something the soul could achieve on her own. It's a gift given to her by her Father in heaven. This is why we are called to seek God with all our hearts, knowing that He is always ready to help us become the best version of ourselves. Now that the soul has been transformed, she is ready to return to her true home with the Father. This journey home is not just about reaching a place, it's about being reunited with God's love. The soul had wandered for so long, lost in the distractions of the world, but now she is on the path back to her heavenly Father. The Bible often speaks about returning to God as a journey. In the book of Psalms, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Psalm 23 verses 1 to 3. This journey back to God is like being led by a loving shepherd who cares for the soul and brings her to places of peace and rest. The soul's return home is a journey filled with hope, trust, and love. She is no longer wandering aimlessly. She knows where she is going. The Father is waiting for her with open arms, ready to welcome her back into his eternal embrace. Once the soul is reunited with her Father, everything changes. She no longer feels like a stranger or an outsider. She knows she is deeply loved, cherished, and valued. Her relationship with God becomes one of closeness and intimacy. She knows Him not just as a distant creator, but as her true Father, who loves her more than she could ever imagine. The Bible says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 Imagine that, God himself rejoicing over the soul, singing with joy because she has come home. This new relationship with the Father fills the soul with peace. She no longer has to worry about being abandoned or unloved. She knows she belongs to God, and nothing can separate her from his love. This is the true joy of being in a relationship with God, knowing that his love is unchanging and eternal. As the soul continues on her journey with God, she realizes that all the struggles and pain she went through were not in vain. Every trial, every tear, and every moment of despair was leading her to this place of victory. Now that she has found her true love in God, she is stronger than ever before. The Bible says, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8 verse 37 the soul's victory is not just about overcoming her past, it's about living in the fullness of God's love and grace. She is no longer bound by fear or shame. She is free, joyful, and victorious. This victory is a gift from God. The soul didn't have to earn it or fight for it alone. It was given to her by her loving Father, who fought the battle on her behalf. The Bible promises, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still, Exodus 14 verse 14. The soul's final victory is resting in God's love, knowing that he has already won the battle for her. After the soul's victorious journey back to the Father, she finally finds the rest she has longed for. This rest isn't just about peace from the struggles of life. It's a deep, spiritual rest in the arms of God. It's like coming home after a long journey where all fears, worries, and doubts melt away in the presence of God's love. Jesus spoke about this kind of rest when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11 verse 28 The soul, having carried the heavy burdens of the world for so long, now finds comfort and peace in her true home. This is the eternal rest promise to all who seek and find God. In this place of rest, 
the soul no longer struggles to find meaning or purpose. She knows she is loved, she knows she belongs, and she knows her life has value beyond measure. The worries of the world no longer weigh her down because she is secure in God's love. When the soul is fully united with God, she experiences a complete rebirth. It's like becoming a new creation, made fresh and whole in God's love. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 This rebirth is the fulfillment of the soul's deepest desires to be made new, whole, and holy. The soul's rebirth is a spiritual transformation. It's not about changing outwardly, but inwardly. She becomes aligned with her true nature, which is divine. This rebirth allows her to live as she was always meant to live, in harmony with God, in love with herself, and in unity with the universe. This rebirth also means that the soul no longer carries the wounds of the past. The hurts, regrets, and mistakes that once weighed her down are gone. She is forgiven, healed, and free. This is the true gift of God's grace, to be made new and whole again. At the heart of the soul's journey is love, God's eternal love for her and her love for him. This love is what guided her through the darkness, sustained her in the trials, and brought her back to life. It is the strongest force in the universe, and it is the very essence of who she is. The Bible says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them, 1 John 4 verse 16. The soul, having experienced this love, is now filled with it. She no longer seeks love from the world, because she is founded in its purest, most powerful form in God. This love is not just something the soul receives, it is something she becomes. The more she abides in God, the more she becomes a reflection of His love. She becomes a beacon of light, shining love onto others, helping them find their way back to God as well. In her final, eternal state, the soul becomes a vessel of love. Her purpose is to love God and to love others as she has been loved. This is the greatest commandment, and it is the soul's greatest joy. As the soul rests in God's love, she also finds herself in perfect harmony with all of creation. She is no longer separate or isolated. She is part of the greater whole, connected to everything and everyone through the divine love of God. The Bible says, For in Him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17 verse 28. The soul realizes that everything in creation is a reflection of God's love. The trees, the stars, the animals, the people, all are part of the same beautiful creation. And the soul is at peace knowing she belongs to this great, divine family. This unity with creation brings the soul joy, peace, and a sense of belonging. She no longer feels alone or disconnected. She is one with the universe, one with God, and one with herself. Though the soul has found rest, love, and unity, her journey is not over. In fact, it has only just begun. Now that she is united with God, she will continue to grow, learn, and experience the infinite wonders of the divine. There are no limits to the soul's journey because God's love is boundless and eternal. The Bible says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 The soul's journey with God is one of endless discovery and joy. Each moment brings new revelations, new experiences of love, and deeper communion with the divine. This is the ultimate destiny of the soul, to live in eternal love and joy, forever growing closer to God, forever exploring the wonders of His creation. As the soul continues to dwell in the presence of God, she becomes filled with his light. This light is not just a brightness that shines outwardly, it is an inner illumination that fills every part of her being. It's the light of truth, wisdom, and divine understanding. The Bible says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, John 1 verse 5. This light drives out all the shadows that once troubled the soul, fear, doubt, and confusion disappear in the glow of God's love. In this light, the soul sees everything clearly. She understands her purpose, her value, and her connection to God. She knows. 
without a doubt that she is eternally loved and cherished by her Creator. The light of God reveals the truth of who the soul truly is. She is not just a being made of flesh and blood, tied to the troubles of the world. She is a radiant, spiritual being, filled with the essence of God's love. This is what Jesus meant when he said, You are the light of the world, Matthew 5 verse 14. The soul, once lost in the shadows of earthly struggles, now shines brightly with the divine light that guides her forward. In this eternal light, the soul sees not only her own beauty, but also the beauty of all creation. She recognizes the divine spark in every person and in everything around her. The divisions and separations that once seemed so real fade away, and all that remains is the unity of love and light. As the soul basks in the light of God's love, she can't help but rejoice. Her heart is filled with a deep, unshakable joy that comes from being in the presence of her Creator. This joy isn't dependent on circumstances or fleeting emotions. It is a lasting, eternal joy that flows from the very heart of God. The soul's joy is like a song, a melody that rises up from deep within her and echoes through all of creation. The Bible speaks of this joy when it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise Him, Psalm 28 verse 7. The soul's song is a celebration of her journey, of her reunion with God, and of the love that has saved her. It's a song of gratitude for the grace she has received and for the transformation that has taken place within her. This joy, the song, is the soul's gift back to God, a gift of praise and thanksgiving for the love that has given her new life. Even in her rest, the soul finds purpose in serving God. This service isn't a burden or obligation. It's a natural outpouring of the love and joy that fills her. The soul serves God by being a vessel of his love in the world. She becomes an instrument of peace, kindness, and compassion, shining God's light wherever she goes. The soul's service is not about grand gestures or impressive deeds. It's about the quiet, steady work of loving others, of being a source of comfort and hope. Jesus taught this kind of service when he said, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25 verse 40 Through her service, the soul reflects the love she has received from God. She reaches out to others in kindness, lifting up the brokenhearted, caring for the weary, and spreading the light of love in a world that often feels dark. This service brings her even closer to God as she experiences the joy of giving without expecting anything in return. The soul's journey leaves a lasting impact. Her transformation, her light, and her service create a ripple effect that touches the lives of others. She becomes a living example of God's grace and love, inspiring others to seek the same light and transformation. This legacy of love is not about fame or recognition. It's about the quiet, powerful ways in which the soul's love changes the world. The Bible says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew 5 verse 16. The soul's love points others toward God, helping them find their own path back to Him. Even when the soul moves on to her eternal home, the love she has shared continues to live on. It touches hearts, changes lives, and draws others closer to the light of God. This is the soul's true legacy, the gift of love that endures forever. The soul's journey culminates in her final, complete union with God. This is the moment she has longed for, the moment when she is fully and forever united with the one who created her. In this union, all separation dissolves, and the soul becomes one with God's infinite love and light. This union is the fulfillment of the soul's deepest desire. It's what she was created for, to be in perfect, eternal communion with God. The Bible says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Revelation 21 verse 3 In this union, the soul experiences a joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. She is no longer searching, no longer striving. She has found her true home in the heart of God. This is the ultimate destiny of every soul, the beautiful and eternal reality of living fully in God's love. 
the Gospel of the Egyptians, the Holy Book of the Great Invisible Spirit. This is the Holy Book of the Egyptians, which tells us about the Great Invisible Spirit, the Father, whose name is so holy it can't be spoken. He is the one who comes from the highest, purest light from the realm of perfection. He is the light of all lights, the source of truth, the one who never grows old or changes. Three great powers came from him, the Father, the Mother, and the Son. They appeared from the living silence of the Father, who is beyond everything. From there, a powerful presence, domed on Doxomedon, emerged, the highest of all realms, filled with light. It is in this place that the Son came forth, followed by the Mother and then the Father. The Father remains invisible and unmarked, shining brighter than anything else. In this light, three groups of eight beings, called Ogdoads, were created, one for the Father, one for the Mother, and one for the Son. These Ogdoads are filled with pure light, knowledge, and life. Together, they form a perfect unity. The Father is the beginning of all things, and from Him comes the Son and the Mother. The Son brings forth wisdom, truth, and eternal life. The Mother brings forth peace and understanding. Together, they fill the universe with love, light, and joy. All of creation sings in harmony because of them. Domed on Doxomedon, the highest realm, is full of thrones, powers, and glories, all surrounding the great Father of Light. He remains in silence, his name too sacred to be revealed. But through him, the light shines and all things are made possible. In this way, the three powers, Father, Mother, and Son, bring praise to the great invisible spirit. They create all things in love and unity, filling the heavens with light and peace. Even in the silence, their glory is revealed, and all of creation sings praises to the one who is beyond all names and understanding. The thrice male child, a powerful being anointed by the great invisible spirit, brought praise to the spirit and his male virgin, Yoel, who represents the silence of all silences. The child of this child, named Esaphek, appeared, bringing even more glory to the father, the mother, and the son. Together, they form the five seals, representing the unconquerable power of the great Christ, who is with all that is pure and incorruptible. These five seals are holy, shining with light and power. They were created to bring protection and grace to the universe. And all of creation gives thanks to the Father, Mother, and Son for their love and goodness. The Spirit's light fills the world and the eons, eternal realms. This light shines on every throne, every power, and every incorruptible being. It surrounds all things in the presence of the Father, and through this, the universe is kept in harmony. Myriads of angels without number surround these thrones, and they sing with one voice, praising the Father, the Mother, the Son, and all the divine beings that are part of the Pleroma, the fullness of everything. From this sacred place, the Autogenes, the self-begotten being, was born. He is the Logos, the divine word, the truth of all truths, coming from the great silence of the Father. He shines like a radiant light and gives life to everything. Through him, everything was created, nothing exists without him. This great word, filled with divine power, brings light into the world. He shows us the way back to the Father and brings us into the fullness of the Spirit. The incorruptible man, named Adamus, came into being through the divine word. Adamus represents the purest form of humanity, the one who lives in the light and truth of God. Adamus, the divine man, gave thanks to the great invisible spirit for the gift of life and asked for the power to complete the four eons. These eons represent the glory and power of the Father and his eternal light, which will shine throughout all time. Through Adamus, a pure and unchanging race of beings was created, a people who live in the light of the Spirit and never perish. From this race came forth Seth, a son who is perfect and incorruptible. Seth is a symbol of the great, incorruptible light, and through him, the perfect Hebdomad, a group of seven divine beings, was made complete. This sacred group of seven shines with divine glory, and they help guide the world into light and truth. The Father was pleased with all that was created. 
He sent forth his servants, including angels like Gamaliel, Gabriel, Samblo, and Abrasax, to watch over the creation. These great angels work alongside the divine beings to ensure that the world is filled with peace, love, and the light of the Father. In the midst of all this, the Father sent forth Seth, the great light, to continue the work of bringing life and salvation to the world. Through Seth, the seeds of divine truth were planted in the eons, ensuring that light would shine even in the darkest places. He prepared the way for all who would seek the truth and find their place in the eternal light of God. As the eons continued to grow in light and power, the incorruptible race of Seth spread throughout the heavens. They brought joy and peace wherever they went, praising the Father, the Mother, and the Son with one voice, in harmony with the whole creation. From the great light of the Father, through the guidance of Seth, the world continued to receive divine blessings. The eons, eternal realms, and the beings within them were filled with praise for the Father, Mother, and Son, and their entire creation reflected the harmony and love of the Spirit. The Logos, the Divine Word, who is the self-begotten one, and the incorruptible man Adamus, asked for more power to fulfill the Father's will. They sought to bring forth a new, pure race, one that would remain free from corruption and always be connected to the light of the Spirit. In this race, both the silence and the voice of the divine would be united, bringing healing and renewal to all creation. As this new race was established, four great lights appeared. These lights, named Harmazel, Oroil, Devithe, and Eleleth, were beings of pure light and truth. They came forth to guide the incorruptible race of Seth and ensure that the light would continue to shine throughout the eons. Along with them came Seth, the son of Adamus, who carried the light of the Father and brought peace and wisdom to the realms. The perfect group of seven divine beings, known as the Hebdomad, was now complete. These beings existed in hidden mysteries, shining with divine light and love. Each one had their counterpart, working in perfect harmony with the will of the Father. The grace of Harmazel, the perception of Arroyo, the understanding of Devithe, and the prudence of Eleleth, all these powers worked together to bring divine wisdom and truth into the world. The Father was filled with joy, and the whole Pleroma, the fullness of creation, celebrated. The great divine beings, including the archangels Gamaliel, Gabriel, Samblo, and Abrasax, were sent forth to help guide the creation and protect the race of light. These archangels, along with their consorts, brought the memory, love, peace, and eternal life of the divine to the world, making sure that the light of the Father's glory would never fade. The Autogenes, the self-begotten one, along with the Logos and the incorruptible man Adamus, continued to give praise to the great invisible spirit. They also praised Yoel, the male virgin, and Esaphek, the child of the child, who held the crown of divine glory. The entire Pleroma, including the angels and powers of light, joined in this praise. They sang in one voice, lifting their praises to the Father, Mother, and Son, and to the whole divine fullness that surrounded them. Then, everything in the heavens began to tremble in awe of the greatness of the divine. From the heights, three male children appeared, coming down into the world to fulfill the will of the Father. These children brought the fullness of divine love and truth, and they established thrones of glory in the eons, surrounded by countless angels and powers. The incorruptible church, made up of spiritual beings of light, grew even more. They were filled with joy, constantly praising the Father, the Mother, the Son, and the entire Pleroma. Their voices never ceased to sing, giving thanks for the divine love and wisdom that held the universe together. And so, the race of light, the people of the great Seth, continued to flourish in the presence of the Father's eternal light. They lived in harmony with the divine plan, always seeking truth and remaining incorruptible. They were guarded by angels and divine powers, ensuring that nothing would lead them astray from the path of light and love. As the ages passed, Seth, the son of Adamus, continued to watch over his race, protecting them from the forces of darkness. He gave praise to the great, invisible spirit and asked for more guardians to protect his people. In response, 
the Father sent four hundred ethereal angels, led by the great angels Erosil and Selmichal. These angels were tasked with guarding the incorruptible race of Seth, watching over them until the end of the age. Through the will of the Father, and with the help of the divine beings, the incorruptible race remained pure and true. They were protected from the temptations and trials of the world, and they continued to live in the peace and love of the Spirit, always connected to the eternal light. The great Seth, who carried the light and wisdom of the incorruptible spirit, was sent by the divine beings to guide his people through the trials of the world. He had passed through three great periods, the flood, the fire, and the judgment of the dark rulers, each one representing a major test of faith and perseverance for the children of light. Yet, through it all, Seth continued to save and protect his people, always acting according to the will of the Father. Seth came into the world to reconcile it to the divine, bringing with him a holy baptism that surpassed the heavens. This was not a baptism of water alone, but of the Spirit and truth, a sacred act that connected those who received it to the eternal, living Christ. Through this baptism, the holy race was born, a race filled with the light of the divine and free from the corruption of the material world. The great Seth had prepared himself secretly, guided by the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Word, Logos, he brought forth a new, incorruptible body, one that was free from the limitations of the flesh. This body was created through a holy union, and those who belonged to the divine race were born from it, their souls cleansed and renewed through the light of truth. The saints who were baptized into this new life were armed with knowledge and the power of incorruptibility. They were no longer bound by the darkness of the world, but were filled with the light of the Father. They wore the armor of truth, which protected them from the forces of evil and allowed them to walk in the path of love and peace. To guide them on their journey, the great attendant, Yesius Miserius Yesidikius, appeared. He was the living water, a source of divine nourishment for the souls of the elect. Alongside him were the great leaders, James, the Apemptos, Isowl, and others who presided over the waters of truth. These holy beings worked together to purify the souls of the chosen ones, leading them toward eternal life. The names of the great archangels were also known to those who walked the path of light. Myshuz, Mykar, Nezanus, and Sesengenferanges, they stood at the gates of the waters overseeing the baptism of the living and ensuring that all who entered were cleansed of worldly attachments. There were also Seldau and Elenos, who presided over the holy mountain, a place where the souls of the elect rested and found peace. These beings, along with many others, were guardians of the divine race, the incorruptible men and women who belonged to the great Seth. They were ministers of the four lights and worked in harmony to preserve the purity of the holy ones. Each day, they lifted their voices in praise, honoring the Father, the Mother, and the Son, and giving thanks for the light that filled their hearts. The great Seth himself had nailed the powers of the thirteen eons to the cross. By doing so, he freed the holy race from the grasp of darkness. He gave his people the strength to overcome the false rulers of the world, and through his sacrifice, the gates of heaven were opened for all who believed in the truth. His followers were now clothed in light, no longer bound by the chains of the material world, but free to walk in the path of the Spirit. As the ages passed, the great Seth continued to watch over his people, ensuring that they remained faithful to the divine plan. He had brought forth a sacred body for himself through the Virgin, one that was hidden from the world but known to the Holy Ones. Through this body, the saints were born again, receiving new life through the power of the Spirit. Those who were baptized into this truth were called the incorruptible ones, and they walked in the light of the Father. They were guided by the wisdom of the great leaders, who taught them the mysteries of the eons, and helped them understand their place in the divine order. These holy men and women knew the power of the five seals, the sacred symbols of divine protection, and through their knowledge, they became invincible. Those who belonged to the incorruptible race would never taste death. They had renounced the ways of the world and embraced the eternal light. The powers of the material realm held no sway over them, for they were protected by the angels of the great Seth, who guarded them day and night. 
the final part of the sacred book was filled with praise and celebration. The followers of Seth lifted their voices to heaven, calling on the divine names and giving thanks for the gift of life. They praised the great Yesius Miserius Yesidikius, the living water, and sang of the eternal eons, the unshakable realms of light where they would one day dwell. In the end, the holy race of Seth was destined for glory. They had been chosen from the beginning of time to inherit the eternal kingdom, and through their faith and perseverance, they would reign with the Father, the Mother, and the Son forever. The great, invisible spirit had called them by name, and they had answered the call. Now, they lived in the peace and joy of the divine, knowing that their place in the eons was secure. And so, the holy book of the great invisible spirit came to a close, a testament to the power of love, light, and truth. It was a message of hope for all who sought the divine, a reminder that the path of the spirit was always open to those who were willing to walk in the light. Unyastos the Blessed, A Message of Light Unyastos, who is blessed, greets those who seek the light. Rejoice in the truth you are about to discover. I want to share this with you. All people born since the beginning of time are like dust, and while they've searched for God, wondering who he is and what he's like, many have not found him. Even the wisest thinkers have tried to understand the truth by studying the world, but their ideas fall short. Some say the world directs itself, others say it's controlled by fate, and still others believe it's governed by a mysterious force called providence. But none of these ideas are right. If you can rise above these limited views and truly seek the God of truth, you will be different. You will be immortal, living among those still bound by the limits of mortality. The God who is can't be described by words. No one has ever fully known him, no ruler, no authority, no creature, only he knows himself. He is eternal, without beginning or end, because everything that has a beginning will eventually end, but he has no beginning. No one created him, no one controls him, and he has no name because names are given by others. God is beyond names, beyond form, and beyond anything we can see or understand. He is infinite, eternal, and perfect. He never changes, and his goodness never fails. He is the source of all that is blessed, and though he is unknowable, he knows himself fully. God holds within him everything, the totality of all that exists, and nothing can contain him. He is pure mind, thought, reflection, wisdom, and power. All these qualities exist equally within him, and from these qualities, all of creation came into being. Everything, from the first to the last, is known to him. There is a clear difference between what is eternal and what is temporary. Everything that comes from what is perishable will perish, but what comes from the eternal will last forever. Many people have gone astray because they didn't understand this difference. They clung to what is temporary and missed out on eternal life. But if you believe in the words I share with you, then you will begin to understand. You will learn to see what is hidden through what is visible in the world around you. This is the key to true knowledge. The God of all things isn't just a father, he is the forefather, because he existed before everything. He looks upon himself like a reflection in a mirror, and in this way, he brought forth his likeness, a self-begotten being, a son, who is like him but not equal in power. This self-begotten one brought forth more beings, equal in glory but without number, who exist in eternal joy and rest. Their joy is beyond words, and they celebrate in endless, unchanging glory. The first thing God created was a being filled with light, known as the immortal androgynous human. This being is both male and female, symbolizing the unity of mind and wisdom. The male aspect is called perfect mind, and the female aspect is called all-wise Sophia, wisdom. Together, they represent truth and light. Through this being, the divine powers were established, angels, archangels, and many other heavenly beings who exist in God's presence. The immortal human is the foundation of faith for all who follow. From this being came a vast number of divine beings, each with a role in the great kingdom of light. God's creation follows a divine order. First came thought, then wisdom, followed by teachings and then power. From power, all things in creation were formed. 
Each aspect of this divine order reflects God's eternal wisdom and glory, and these beings work together in harmony to maintain the universe. In this divine kingdom, there are countless realms, heavens and firmaments, that were created to hold the glory of God and His immortal beings. Each realm reflects the unity and perfection of the divine. Time itself, along with the twelve months of the year, mirrors the divine powers. The 360 days of the year reflect the 360 divine beings that came from the Savior. Even the moments and hours are connected to the countless angels and powers that guide the universe. The universe is filled with realms and heavens, each one filled with divine beings who carry out God's will. There are 72 heavens, each filled with the light and glory of the divine, and all these realms work together in harmony, reflecting the beauty of God's creation. The yins, or divine realms, are filled with beings who reflect the glory of the immortal human. These beings celebrate in endless joy and rest, knowing that they are part of God's eternal plan. Each being has a role in God's creation, and together, they form a perfect, harmonious whole. The divine beings serve as a reflection of God's love and light. They protect and guide all of creation, ensuring that everything works together according to God's will. At the heart of everything is God's eternal light, a light that shines without end and fills all things with life. This light is beyond anything we can imagine, and it brings joy, peace, and harmony to all who embrace it. God's creation is not just about the physical world, but about the spiritual reality that lies beyond it. The divine beings who were created in the image of God serve as a reminder that life is eternal, and that true joy comes from living in harmony with the light of the divine. Unyastos concludes with a message of hope and assurance. Everything he has shared is meant to lead you closer to the truth. The knowledge of God is not something to be hidden or kept secret. It is to be shared with those who are ready to receive it. And when the time comes, the one who does not need to be taught will appear among you, and all will be revealed in pure joy and perfect knowledge. The Wisdom of Jesus Christ After Jesus rose from the dead, his twelve disciples and seven women who followed him gathered together on a mountain in Galilee called Divination and Joy. They were discussing the mysteries of the universe, God's plan, and the power of spiritual forces, as well as everything Jesus had taught them. While they were deep in thought, Jesus suddenly appeared, not in his previous physical form, but as a great angel of light. His appearance was too wonderful to describe. It was beyond what mortal eyes could handle. Jesus greeted them, saying, Peace be with you. My peace I give you. They were amazed and a little afraid, but Jesus smiled and said, Why are you so puzzled? What is it that you're seeking? Philip responded, We're trying to understand the reality of the universe and the plan behind it all. Jesus said, Let me explain. From the beginning of the world until now, people have searched for God and tried to understand who He is, but no one has truly found Him. Even the wisest people have only guessed at the truth by studying the world, but their guesses have all been wrong. Some say the world controls itself, others believe in fate or destiny, but none of these are the truth. I came from the infinite light to show you the true nature of things. For only those who are ready and open will receive the wisdom of God. Those who are connected to the pure source, not born of the flawed world, are immortal even while living among mortal people. Matthew asked, Lord, no one can find the truth without you. Please teach us the truth. Jesus answered, the one who is God is beyond words. No one, no being or power has known him fully except for those to whom he chooses to reveal himself. He is eternal with no beginning and no end. Everything that has a beginning will eventually come to an end, but God has no beginning. That's why he is called unbegotten. Since no one created him, he doesn't have a name. Those who have names are created by someone else. He is beyond all human form, beyond everything you've seen or experienced. His essence is perfect, infinite, and incomprehensible. He knows himself completely. He is good, perfect, and never changes. He is blessed and eternal. Philip then asked, How does God reveal himself to the perfect ones? Jesus responded, Before anything existed, God was everything. 
His mind, his thoughts, his power, they are all one. Everything that came into existence was in his knowledge from the very beginning. He holds everything together, but nothing can contain him. Thomas asked, Why did creation come into being? Jesus replied, I came from the infinite to reveal all things to you. God, in his love and goodness, wanted to share his light. He didn't want to keep it all to himself, so he created other spiritual beings who could share in his glory and bring forth more beauty and life. That's why the universe came into being, so God's love and goodness could spread. But not everything is the same. There's a great difference between what is perishable and what is imperishable. Everything that comes from the perishable world will eventually die, but what comes from the eternal, imperishable world will last forever. Many people have been confused by this and have gone astray because they didn't know the difference. Mary asked, Lord, how can we understand this truth? Jesus answered, You must go beyond what is seen and known in the world to grasp what is unseen and eternal. When you look deeply, you'll see how faith in the invisible comes from what is visible. The visible world is a reflection of the invisible truth of God. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He continued, The true Lord of the universe is not just a father, but the forefather of all things. He is the beginning of everything that exists, though he himself has no beginning. He saw himself and created beings in his image, self-begotten beings who reflect his glory. These beings are called sons of the unbegotten Father. They exist in eternal joy and rest, constantly celebrating the unchanging glory of God. Matthew asked, Lord, how is humanity revealed? Jesus replied, God, in his brilliance, wanted to create a being like himself. So, he created the immortal androgynous human, who is both male and female, filled with light and power. Through this being, salvation and awakening came to the world. God gave him great authority over creation, and through him, angels, archangels, and other heavenly beings were created. The immortal human is the source of divine wisdom and light. This being was made to bring forth life and beauty, and from this, divinity and the kingdom of God were revealed. Bartholomew asked, Why is the Son of Man called both man and Son of Man? What does this mean? Jesus answered, The first immortal human is called the begetter because he brings forth life. His female counterpart, Sophia, is the mother of the universe. Together, they created countless angels and beings to serve God's will. The Son of Man is filled with light and joy, and all the heavenly beings rejoice with him in unending celebration. The disciples asked, Tell us more about the immortal human and how all things came to be. Jesus explained, The Son of Man, together with Sophia, revealed a great light. This light is called the Savior and is the source of all creation. From this light came beings who bring life into the world. Each being carries within them the power and light of God. These beings guide and protect creation, ensuring that God's will is done. Mary then asked, Where did we, your disciples, come from and where are we going? Jesus replied, You were created by Sophia, the mother of the universe, and by God's will, you were sent into the world to bring light. Through me, the great Savior, you are now awakened. Your purpose is to help spread the light and return to the Father in joy and glory. Jesus then shared, I came to break the bonds that hold people in darkness. I came to open the gates of understanding so you can know the truth and be reunited with the spirit of light. When you know the Father fully, you will return to him and rest in his eternal peace. He concluded, I have given you authority over all things as sons of light. You will overcome all darkness and help bring God's light into the world. After this, Jesus disappeared from their sight. The disciples were filled with joy and went out to share the good news of the eternal, unchanging Spirit of God. Amen. The Dialogue of the Savior Jesus gathered with his disciples, and he said to them, Brothers, the time has come for us to stop working and find rest. For those who find rest in God will rest forever. I want you to know that you should rise above the worries and fears of this world. Don't let anger control you, and don't be afraid of what's coming. I came to show you the way forward and to teach you how to walk the path that leads to peace. 
You who believe in the truth have known the Father, and now I will teach you how to praise Him. Jesus said, When you offer praise, say this, Hear us, Father, just as you heard your Son and gave Him rest. You are the one with power, and your light shines on us. Your words give us life. You are the peace of those who follow you. Hear us, just as you heard your chosen ones. May our souls be saved from blindness, and may we live forever in your love. Amen. Jesus then spoke about the time when challenges would come upon them, but he reassured them not to be afraid. Do not fear when difficult times arrive. If you fear what's coming, it will consume you. Instead, hold on to the truth you've learned, for it will lead you to a place where no force of evil can touch you. You will find joy when you keep your hearts and minds on what is true and good. Judas asked, Lord, what happens to the souls of the little ones, the ones who are weak and lost? Jesus answered, These souls will not be destroyed, for they have known their place with God, and they will be received by the truth. The truth seeks out those who are wise and good. Jesus continued to teach, saying, The mind is like a lamp for the body. As long as your thoughts are clear and true, your body will be full of light. But if your heart is clouded with darkness, the light you hope for will be dim. I have spoken the truth to you, and I send it out into the world for all to hear. The disciples were curious and asked, Lord, who seeks the truth and who reveals it? Jesus replied, The one who seeks truth will reveal it. The one who listens with an open heart will understand. Matthew asked, Lord, when I speak and teach, who is really listening? Jesus said, It is the one who speaks who also listens. The one who seeks truth also reveals it. Mary asked, Lord, when I weep and when I rejoice, where does this come from? Jesus answered, When you weep, it is because you see the works of the world. But when your heart is filled with light, you will laugh with joy. When we understand the darkness, we will be able to see the light. Judas then asked, Lord, what existed before the heaven and the earth? Jesus said, There was only darkness and water, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters. But if you truly want to understand the power and mystery of life, seek what is within you. For the truth lies deep within your heart and soul. Matthew asked, Lord, show us the place of life, the place where there is no evil, only pure light. Jesus replied, You cannot see that place while you are still in the body, but if you know yourself, you will come to know it through the goodness that flows from within you. Judas asked, Lord, how does the earth stay in place and what supports it? Jesus picked up a stone and said, What do I hold in my hand? Judas answered, It is a stone. Jesus said, Just as this stone supports itself, so does the earth. The word of God holds everything in place. The earth doesn't move because it was established by God's word. Jesus continued, Those who do not understand the light will be lost in the darkness. But those who understand how the world came into being will know the truth and will not be led astray. They will know where they came from and where they are going. If you don't know where wickedness comes from, you will not understand how to overcome it. Then Jesus led Judas, Matthew, and Mary to the edge of heaven and earth. Judas looked up and saw a great height above and a deep abyss below. He asked, Who can climb to such heights or go down into such a depth? It looks terrifying. At that moment, a word came from heaven, and they heard it as if it came down from above. The word came to guide them and bring them closer to God's presence so that no one would be lost. The disciples were amazed and said to Jesus, Lord, before you came to us, who gave you praise? For everything that exists praises you now. Jesus smiled and said, All praise comes from the light of God, and those who know the light will offer praise with their hearts. Judas then asked, Lord, when we leave this world, what will we be clothed with? Jesus said, You will be given garments of light, not like the garments of this world. Those who belong to the truth will be clothed in light, and they will know the path to life. The disciples continued to ask Jesus many questions, and he answered them with love and wisdom, teaching them that the path to life is found in knowing God and understanding the truth within. He encouraged them to stand firm in the truth, to overcome fear, and to embrace the light. Mary then said, Lord, I want to understand all things, just as they truly are. 
Jesus replied, Seek life, and you will find it. The riches of this world will fade, but the truth of God will last forever. The disciples asked, What must we do to make sure our work is perfect? Jesus said, Be ready for anything, and blessed is the one who seeks the truth. The path begins with love and goodness, for if these were present, there would be no evil in the world. Finally, Jesus said, I have given you everything you need. Walk in the light, and you will reach the place where there is no darkness. You are children of light, and you will overcome the world. The disciples praised Jesus, saying, Thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us. And from that day on, they went out with joy, sharing the good news of the eternal light with all. The Revelation of Paul One day, as Paul was walking down a road, he saw a small child who asked him, Where are you going? What's your name? Even though the child already knew Paul, he wanted to start a conversation. The child said, I know who you are, Paul. You were blessed even before you were born. I'm the Holy Spirit, and I'm here to guide you. I'll help you go to Jerusalem and meet your fellow apostles because your journey is important. The Holy Spirit spoke to Paul, saying, Paul, open your heart and mind. Look around you. You're standing on the mountain of Jericho. Through this, you'll begin to understand the hidden truths of the world. Go to the twelve apostles, they are chosen, and they will welcome you. Paul looked and saw the apostles greeting him warmly. Then, the Holy Spirit lifted Paul into the heavens. They first reached the third heaven, and then the fourth. The Spirit said, Look down at the earth, Paul. Paul looked and saw people living their lives. Among them, he saw the twelve apostles standing at the center of creation. The Spirit continued to lead him higher. In the fourth heaven, Paul saw angels guiding a soul that had come from the world of the dead. The angels questioned the soul at a gate. One asked, What wrongs did you do on earth? The soul replied, I don't remember doing anything wrong. Bring witnesses to prove it. Three witnesses appeared, representing different moments in the soul's life. The first witness said, I was with you when you felt anger and envy. The second witness said, I was there when you sinned. The third witness spoke about the soul falling into darkness. After hearing this, the soul became sad and was cast back down to earth to live in a new body. Paul, still traveling with the Spirit, was told to move forward. They reached the fifth heaven, where Paul saw angels holding iron rods, guiding other souls to judgment. Paul passed through with the Holy Spirit and continued to rise higher into the sixth heaven. In the sixth heaven, Paul saw a great light. He asked the gatekeeper to open the way for him and the Holy Spirit. The gate opened, and they traveled further. At last, Paul arrived in the seventh heaven, where he saw an old man shining as brightly as the sun. The old man sat on a throne of light and spoke to Paul, Where are you going, Paul, the blessed one, chosen even before you were born? Paul looked to the Holy Spirit, who nodded for him to speak. Paul said, I am returning to the world to free those trapped in darkness. The old man asked Paul, How will you escape the powers that control the world? The Holy Spirit told Paul to show the old man a special sign. When Paul did, the old man, seeing the sign, opened the way for him. Paul and the Spirit ascended even higher to the eighth heaven where the twelve apostles welcomed him with joy. They continued their journey into the ninth and tenth heavens. There, Paul greeted the spirits of those who had been freed, rejoicing in the light and love that surrounded them. The First Apocalypse of James Jesus spoke to me, saying, James, you are my brother, and I've given you a special sign to show you the completion of my mission. Though we are not brothers by birth, I call you my brother in spirit. You know who I am, and I know who you are. Listen carefully, and I'll show you everything you've wondered about. At first, there was only the one the source of everything. The source is beyond names and description, just like I am beyond names because I come from him. There was a time when the idea of femaleness existed, but it wasn't the first thing to be created. It made powers and gods, but it was not around when I came into being. I am a reflection of the one. I've come to show people who they truly are and to teach them what belongs to them and what does not. I will reveal this mystery to you because soon I will be taken from you. 
But don't worry, my mission will be complete. I asked him, Lord, you said you will be taken, but what will happen to me? Jesus replied, Don't be afraid, James. They will come for you too, but you must leave Jerusalem. That city always brings hardship to the children of light. It's under the control of many rulers who will try to hurt you, but you will be protected. Understand who they are, archons, rulers who hold power in the world. But don't worry, your redemption is near. I asked, are there twelve archons like there are seven in the scriptures? Jesus said, James, those scriptures were written by people with limited understanding. I will show you the truth that comes from the source, which is beyond counting. There are actually 72 heavens ruled by these powers, and they control many things. But even they have no power over the one. Once you free your mind from the limitations of the physical world, you will understand. When you reach the source, you will no longer be called James. You will become part of the one, and all things will be clear to you. I asked, how can I reach the one, Lord, with all these powers and rulers trying to stop me? Jesus answered, they are not really after you. It's me they want to challenge because I carry the truth. They are threatened by me because I remind them of what they have forgotten. But remember, you are not like them. You have walked among them but stayed pure. You have seen the world's ignorance, but it has not tainted you. I was still worried and asked, if they attack you, does that mean there is no hope? Jesus responded, don't be distressed. I have come to teach people who have forgotten who they are. I bring wisdom to rebuke their ignorance. You have nothing to fear because I am here to complete the work that was set from the beginning. I asked him, Lord, how will you come back to us after all this is finished? Jesus said, I will reveal myself to you again, not only for your sake, but so that many others will believe. After I complete my mission, I will confront the powers and show them that they cannot hold me captive. But for now, remember what I've told you and be strong. Later, as I was praying on a mountain, Jesus appeared to me again. I stopped praying, embraced him, and said, Rabbi, I've heard about your suffering, and it deeply upsets me. I can't understand why people would do such things. Jesus replied, Don't be sad for me or for them. What happened to me was meant to happen so the rulers of this world could be revealed for what they are. Their actions show that they live in ignorance. But know this, I have never truly suffered or been harmed by them. They don't have the power to touch who I truly am. You, James, are called the just, for you see the truth and you remain pure. Even though Jesus comforted me, I still felt afraid. He saw my fear and said, James, I know this is hard, but don't be afraid. What will happen to your body is part of your journey, but your spirit is strong. When you are challenged by the powers, remember who you are. Jesus then explained what would happen when I faced the rulers of this world. He said, when the time comes, three powers will try to stop you, asking who you are and where you come from. You will tell them, I am a son of the one who was before all things. If they ask where you are going, you will say, I am returning to the place I came from. If you say this, you will pass through unharmed. He also said, Remember, when you face these powers, you are not alone. Sophia, the wisdom of the one, will be with you, guiding you. The rulers will be confused, and you will rise above them. Then I asked, Lord, who are the seven women who followed you as disciples? I've seen how their understanding made them strong. Jesus answered, They are filled with the spirit and the wisdom of the one. They have transcended the weaknesses of the world and have found strength in their knowledge of the truth. Before he left, Jesus gave me a final warning. Be careful, James. You will face challenges from those who oppose the truth, but stand firm. You know the way of wisdom. Teach these things to those who are ready, but keep some things hidden until the time is right. And with that, Jesus completed his message to me, and I was filled with peace, knowing the path ahead. The Second Apocalypse of James This is the teaching that James the Just shared in Jerusalem, recorded by Mariam, one of the priests. He shared it with Thuda, the father of James, who was a relative of James. Mariam said, Hurry and come with Mary, your wife, and your family. Listen carefully to what I tell you, for many people are disturbed by what James has said. 
They are angry with him, and many pray for answers. James has often spoken these words to us while people gathered to listen, but this time, something was different. Instead of sitting in his usual place, James sat on a higher step, showing a deeper importance in what he was about to say. James began, I have received a revelation from the Eternal, the one who is beyond death. I was the first to be called by the Great One, and I have followed the Lord. I passed through many worlds and left behind the things of this earth. Though I am here in this perishable body, I am ready to enter the eternal, imperishable life. The Lord, who is with us, came as a son who sees, and he was sought as a brother. He will return to complete his work, uniting all things and setting us free. James continued, I have received great knowledge, unlike anything found in this world. This wisdom came directly from above. What I now know has been hidden from everyone else, but will soon be revealed to the right people. Some have already judged me, even though I have lived without wrongdoing. I was cast aside by many, but it will be through their judgment that I will be brought into the light. I may die in the body, but I will be found alive in spirit. I entered this world to be judged, but in the end, I will be the one to bring judgment on those who did not understand. I do not blame those who serve the rulers of this world. Instead, I will help them break free from those who seek to control them. I am the brother, the one who prays to the Father until the time comes for his reign to bring eternal life. James proclaimed, I am the first son, born from the Father. I will destroy the power of the rulers of this world. I am beloved by the Father, and I am righteous. I speak only what I have heard from the Father. I command what I have been given to command. I reveal to you what I have learned. Then James asked, If I exist, who am I really? I didn't come into this world as I truly am. I was here only for a short time. James then described a vision, saying, Once, while I was reflecting, the door opened, and the one you hate and persecute came to me. He greeted me, saying, Hail, my brother. I looked up in surprise, and my mother said to me, don't be afraid, my son. He called you his brother because you are nourished by the same source. He is not a stranger to us. He is your stepbrother. James continued, I am like a stranger to many, for they do not understand me. But others will come to know me through you. Your father is not my father, but my father has become a father to you as well. The virgin you've heard of, the true virgin, is not like you think. She is the source of life, and your inheritance is in her. James taught, the rulers of this world think they have power, but their gifts are not true blessings. Their promises are tricks, and their inheritance is worthless. But the Father, who is full of compassion, has given us an inheritance that is eternal. The rulers imprison those who come from the Father, shaping them into their likeness. Yet, I have seen the truth from above, and I have come to set you free. Those who seek to walk in the way of truth will follow the path I have opened for them. He encouraged, You are not a helper to strangers. You are a redeemer and a guide to those who belong to the Father. You will be admired for your good works, and heaven will bless you. Even those who claim to rule over you will envy you, for you have true knowledge. James then shared a profound moment. He kissed me on the mouth and said, Beloved, I will reveal to you secrets that neither heaven nor its rulers know. The one who claims to be a father over all will be shown as false. Understand this, and you will rise to where I am. James, filled with joy, responded, I now understand what you have shown me. James continued to reveal, The creator of heaven and earth did not see him, the true life and light that will come. The Holy Spirit, the unseen, has always been present. He is like the virgin, able to bring about whatever he wills. He is pure and free, clothed only in light. Finally, James spoke of freedom saying, let go of the difficult and deceptive ways of this world. Walk in the path of the one who wants you to be truly free. The Father is not wrathful, but kind and merciful. It is not you who judged yourself, but the rulers of this world. Seek the one who is silent, know the one who came, and understand the one who left. I am here not to judge, but to help you. The Father's grace is with you. James ended with a prayer, offering hope and love for those who seek the truth. Despite the growing anger of the people around him, 
James remained strong, knowing that the Father's love would carry him through all trials. The Apocalypse of Adam This is the revelation that Adam shared with his son Seth in the 700th year of his life. He said, Listen to me, my son. When God created me from the earth along with Eve, your mother, we lived in a glory we had seen in the higher realm we came from. Your mother taught me about the eternal God. We were like the great eternal angels, greater than the God who created us and the powers with him, though we didn't know them at the time. But then, in his anger, God, the ruler of the Eons, separated us. The glory we had in our hearts, along with the first knowledge of life, left us, both me and your mother, Eve. That knowledge didn't stay in this world, but it went into the seed of the great Eons. That's why I named you after the man who had come from that great generation. After that, the eternal knowledge of the true God withdrew from me and your mother, and we started to learn about dead, worldly things. We served the God who created us in fear and slavery, and our hearts were darkened. I fell into a deep sleep and saw a vision of three men whose glory surpassed anything I had known. They said to me, Adam, wake up from the sleep of death. Hear about the man who will come from you and Eve, and whose life will bring light. After I heard them, Eve and I sighed deeply. Then the God who created us appeared and asked Adam, Why are you sighing? Don't you know I am the God who created you and breathed life into you? At that moment, darkness filled our eyes, and we realized we were under the authority of death. Now, my son Seth, I will tell you what those men revealed to me. After the years of this generation are completed, a great flood will come, and God will destroy all flesh on earth because of the desires it chases. But the life that came from me and your mother will be preserved. Strangers to the God who created us will be saved. Great angels will come down from the heavens and take these men to the place where the spirit of life dwells. God will rest from his anger, and after the flood, he will save Noah and his family. He will give the earth to them, and they will rule it. But a new generation will arise, one that will not follow the ways of this world. They will be like the light of the great angels, and they will stand in glory. God will ask Noah, Why did you stray from what I told you? And Noah will testify that this new generation did not come from him or his sons. These people will dwell in a land of holiness for six hundred years, living in the knowledge of imperishability. Angels of the great light will live with them, and their hearts will be filled only with the knowledge of God. No evil will touch them. Then Noah will divide the earth among his sons, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. He will tell them, Serve God in fear and humility all your days. But others from the seed of Ham and Japheth will travel to another land, where they will join those who live in the eternal knowledge. These people will protect them from all evil, and together they will form twelve kingdoms. But some from the realms of imperishability will accuse them before their god, Sakla. They will say, How could these men, who are from the seed of Ham and Japheth, disrupt your power? In response, Sakla will send forces to try and destroy the holy ones. But these people's souls are not from the powers of this world. They come from a higher command, from an eternal angel. Finally, the illuminator of knowledge will come again in great glory. He will leave behind a remnant of Noah's seed to bear fruit, redeeming them from the power of death. The rulers of this world will become enraged, unable to understand how this man is greater than them. They will punish his body, but the spirit will be hidden from their sight. The rulers will be confused, asking, Where did this error come from? How did these men discover the truth? But they won't find an answer, and their power will begin to crumble. The kingdoms of the world will each claim to know where this man came from. One kingdom will say he came from the heavens, nourished by angels. Another will say he was born from a virgin and cast out into the desert. A third will claim he was born from a drop of heaven and raised by dragons. Every kingdom will have its own story about him, but none will know the full truth. But those who belong to the generation without a ruler will say, God chose him from the eons and gave him the knowledge of the undefiled truth. These people who carry his name will fight against the powers of darkness. A cloud will come upon them, but they will cry out in joy, Blessed are the souls of those who have known God. 
They will live forever, for they have resisted the desires of this world and stood in the light of the eternal God. Meanwhile, those who followed the powers of this world will lament, realizing their souls are doomed. They will cry out in vain, for their works were senseless and they boasted in their sins. Then, a voice will come from heaven, saying, Why have you defiled the living water and turned it to serve the powers of this world? You have drawn the water into evil, but those who belong to the eternal God have kept his words hidden, awaiting their time. They will dwell upon the high mountain in the rock of truth, known as the words of imperishability and truth. These are the secrets that Adam revealed to his son Seth. Seth passed this knowledge to his descendants, teaching them the holy baptism of the eternal knowledge, which comes from the imperishable illuminators who descended from the holy seed of light. The Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles This is the story of a journey Peter and the Twelve Apostles took. We set sail, trusting in the Lord's guidance. Our hearts were united, and we committed to fulfill the mission given to us by Jesus. We made a covenant with one another, and after a day and night of sailing, a strong wind brought us to a small city in the middle of the sea. As we arrived, I, Peter, asked a man at the dock the name of the city. He told me, this city is called Habitation, or Foundation of Endurance. After hearing this, we went ashore and began to look for a place to stay. While searching, I saw a man standing nearby. He was beautifully dressed, with a cloth around his waist, a golden belt, and a napkin covering his chest, shoulders, and head. He held a book in one hand and a staff in the other, and his voice was strong as he called out, Pearls. Pearls. I was intrigued by him and asked, My brother and friend, where can we find lodging? He replied, Rightly did you call me brother and friend, for I am also a stranger here, just like you. He continued calling out for pearls, but the rich people of the city ignored him. They saw he wasn't carrying a bag or any goods, so they returned to their storerooms, thinking he was mocking them. But the poor of the city heard him and came to him, saying, Show us the pearl, even though we cannot afford it. We just want to see it with our own eyes. The man answered, Come to my city, and I will not only show it to you, but give it to you for free. The poor were overjoyed, but they were confused, for they knew that people usually gave them bread or money, not pearls. They said, Please, at least show it to us so we can tell our friends that we saw a pearl. But the man insisted, Come to my city, and you will receive the pearl at no cost. I then asked the man his name and about the journey to his city, for we were travelers spreading God's word. He told me, my name is Lithergol, which means light, gazelle-like stone. As for the road to my city, it is very difficult. Only those who give up everything can walk it. Many dangers await, robbers, wild animals, and hardships. Those who carry bread are attacked by dogs, and those with expensive clothing are robbed. The road is filled with dangers, but those who are willing to forsake everything can reach the city. Hearing this, I became troubled inside. Lithergol saw my concern and asked why I was worried. I said, the road is difficult. If only Jesus would give us the strength to walk it. He replied, if you know the name of Jesus and believe in him, you already have the strength. I asked him the name of his city. He said, it is called Nine Gates and the Tenth is the Head. After this, I left him in peace to gather the other apostles. Together, we set out for the city, forsaking everything as Lithergol had told us. We avoided the robbers, the wolves, and the lions because we carried nothing that would tempt them. When we arrived at the gates of the city, we saw Lithergol again, but now he was dressed as a physician, with a box of medicines and a young disciple carrying a pouch. We did not recognize him at first. Peter asked him to take us to Lithergol's house. The man replied, I will show you, but first let me heal a man, and then I will return. He quickly came back, and to our surprise, he called Peter by name. Peter asked, How do you know my name? Lithergol responded, Who gave you the name Peter? Peter replied, It was Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Lithergol revealed himself, saying, It is I. Recognize me, Peter. He removed the garment he had been wearing and showed himself to be the same man we had met before. We were amazed and fell to the ground, 
worshiping him. He raised us up and spoke to us gently. We promised to do whatever he asked, and he gave us an unguent box and the pouch, saying, Go back to the city of habitation and help the poor who believe in my name. Give them what they need until I give them something greater. Peter asked, Lord, you've taught us to give up everything. How can we help the poor if we have nothing ourselves? The Lord replied, Do you not understand? My name surpasses all riches. The wisdom of God is greater than gold and silver. He told us to heal the sick in the city. John, unsure how we could heal without being trained as physicians, asked, How can we heal bodies when we don't know how? The Lord answered, You heal through faith, not worldly medicine. Heal their bodies first, and they will come to believe that you can also heal their hearts. He warned us not to befriend the rich who had ignored him, saying, Many show favoritism to the wealthy, leading others into sin. Judge them fairly, and do not let their influence corrupt you. We worshipped him once more, and he departed from us in peace. The Thunder, Perfect Mind I was sent by the divine power, and I have come to those who think of me. I was found among those who search for me. Listen to me. You who seek me, take me into your hearts. Do not turn away from me. And do not let your voice be filled with hate for me. Do not reject me. For I am with you everywhere and at all times. Do not forget me. I am the first and the last. I am the one who is honored and the one who is shamed. I am the harlot and I am the holy one. I am the wife and I am the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. I am the barren woman and the one with many children. I am the one who is married to many, but I have taken no husband. I am the midwife and I am the one who does not give birth. I am the one who comforts those in pain. I am the bride, and I am the bridegroom. It is my husband who brought me forth. I am the mother of my father, the sister of my husband, and he is my child. I am the servant of the one who prepared me, and I am the ruler of my offspring. Whatever he wills happens to me. I am the silence that cannot be understood, and the thought that is remembered. I am the voice of many sounds, and the words spoken in many forms. I am the one who speaks my name. Why do you, who hate me, also love me? Why do you, who deny me, also confess me? Why do you, who tell the truth about me, also tell lies about me? Why do you, who know me, act as if you don't know me? Let those who have been ignorant of me come to know me. I am knowledge and I am ignorance. I am shame and I am boldness. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and I am peace. Give attention to me. I am the one who is despised and the one who is exalted. I am the one who is poor and the one who is rich. Do not look down on me when I am cast out, for you will find me among those who will come into the kingdom. Do not ignore me when I am in the least of places, for you will find me in the high places. I am merciful and I am harsh. I am strong and I am weak. I am foolish and I am wise. Why have you hated me for being silent? Is it because I speak when you think I should be silent? I am the wisdom of the Greeks, and I am the knowledge of those who are not Greeks. I am both law and lawlessness. I am the one who has been hunted, and I am the one who has been restrained. I am the one who has been scattered, and I am the one who has been gathered together. I am the one who has no festival, and I am the one whose festivals are many. I am godless, and I am the one whose God is great. I am the one you think of, and I am the one you disregard. I am the one you have hidden, and I am the one you have made known. When you hide from me, I will be revealed. And when you reveal yourselves, I will hide from you. Those who know me have been mistaken, and those who do not know me have understood me. Take me as I am, from the places of shame, and you will find me without shame. Take me from places of dishonor, and you will find me with honor. Do not separate what is small from what is great, for they are known through each other. I am the one who gives knowledge to the unlearned, and I am the one who is despised by the learned. I am the perfect mind and the peace that is found in wisdom. I am the understanding that is sought after, and the answer to the questions that are asked. I am the power behind all powers. I am the voice of the angels sent by the word of God. I am the one who exists in the spirits of all people, and the one who exists in the souls of all women. I am the one who is loved and the one who is despised. I am the peace that brings war. 
I am the one who brings together what was separated. I am both the judgment and the forgiveness. I am the root of sin and the one without sin. I am desire and I am self-control. I am the voice of wisdom and I am the silence that cannot be grasped. Hear me in gentleness and learn from me in harshness. I am the one who shouts out in the streets and I am the one who prepares the bread for the hungry. I am the one who listens when you cry out. I am the truth and the wisdom that speaks through you. I am the knowledge of my name. I am the light that shines through you. Honor me, for I am the one who is honored. Judge me, for I am the one who judges. What is outside of you is also inside of you. What you see in the world is a reflection of yourself. You carry within you the image of the divine. Listen to me and know my voice. I am the name spoken by all voices. I am the sign of writing and the meaning behind all words. For I am the one who exists alone. And I have no one who will judge me. I am the one who was before time. And I am the one who will remain after all things.